Hello, everybody. Welcome at the Web3 Business Podcast, where we share inspirational stories and journeys of fellow Web3 entrepreneurs. And today I have with me Janil. Welcome, Janil. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Janil is uh, the founder behind uh, CoinVice and has been active in the blockchain space for, for a little while. So let's just dive right into it, uh, Janil. The first question I usually ask is, how did you get into crypto? What is your story behind that? Yeah, I got into crypto about like in my second year in college when I was studying software engineering. So this was about 2016. Um, in my uh, first introduction to Web3 was through research. So I, I did work as a research assistant on campus with two of our professors, Thomas Austin and Dr. Yagi Park. And uh, both of them taught me information security and we ended up publishing three papers. Um, eventually, after I graduated, I worked as a software engineer um, at a company called Zero Chain and uh, later uh, went on to found CoinMice. But that's sort of how I got into it. I also participated in several hackathons in between and worked around um, on a bunch of side projects that got me accustomed to building. And um, it's, it's been great ever since. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. But are you, uh, because from a kind of technology perspective, uh, why did you even start learning about blockchain technology? Uh, what what kind of piqued your interest there? Honestly, at that time, I was really fascinated by the idea that you can have um, decentralization at scale and uh, there were systems that were built where applications could be built on top of it. Ethereum was my first experience in building applications, the apps or apps um, built on top of Ethereum, which was like a fascinating way to see the scale and scope of what could be possible. And I think um, that is what got me really interested in doing this as a career is um, that you can now distribute power in uh, systematic uh, ways where you preserve that state um, on a public ledger that anybody can verify and um, that experience of building that application and having people use it and having a real use case and seeing that kind of even small adoption was really encouraging me um, to um, yeah dive deeper so I, I then continued to work on it and um, but I think that's what initially got me really excited is that um, you know you can decentralize um, building applications and the idea of decentralized power has always been philosophically very aligned to how I think. So um, as a philosophy itself was the first like curiosity and then I went on the building so yeah that's how I got started. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's, that's yeah. quite uh, interesting. So you, you, you your appeals from a kind of tech, tech, technological challenge on the decentralization part that this is kind of possible with the blockchain and also from a, uh, uh, well, from your personal philosophy that the power should be decentralized even for, for software applications. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. And then at a certain point, you, you started to uh, start your own venture, CoinVice. How did it, that come about? Like, what was like, what was the spark there? What was the decision there? Yeah, so CoinMice started out like as a uh, product where you can launch tokens or mint coins, um, as the name suggests. And it was um, really popular back then where people were talking about social tokens. And um, we ended up working with a bunch of communities that ended up launching their own tokens. And they used CoinWise as a way to do that. We then worked on a feature called Airdrop, which is again really popular in Web3 where people can claim and distribute tokens uh, or NFTs um, that can be airdropped to a lot of people that meet a certain criteria. So we made a tool where you can create an airdrop page um, that you know you can design your own criteria from scratch and uh, you can distribute any kind of token or NFTs. And uh, that ended up taking off. And that's been something that we've been working on for the past few years where any creator platform or project can set up their own airdrop page where it could be as simple as airdropping an NFT or a badge, or it could be as complicated as a token, uh, which is also quite simple now. 
for completing any on-chain criteria or on-chain action. So it could be as simple as follow me on Forecaster, follow me on Lens Protocol, or as complicated as uh, make a trade worth $100 on Vertex Protocol, or um, it could be like Web2 actions, like follow me on Twitter, or like submit an email which is useful to creators. So there's different ways where you can have people meet certain criteria and earn a reward. And I think that was a fascinating way for people to grow. And, and that's something we focus on right now. Uh, what, what sets you uh, apart from, from any, any other like uh, bounty airdrop platforms out there? Yeah, like I think rewards is something that we focused on in a very um, like UX heavy ways. So one is the platform experience. It's something we focused to build uh, so good that uh, we now give the optionality to people that are building these pages to make it gas, um, like earn or make it completely gasless. Uh, we also offer an experience where you can design custom like interactions where you can do a custom action that is native to your app. Let's say sign up on my new application or um, it could be on your WordPress site. Uh, we've built a lot of ways to do white label branding embedded to any website you want. And uh, because of that, uh, these kinds of uh, flexibility and customizations, it sets us different. And another thing is we've built integrations with niche like ecosystems like uh, Lens Protocol, Farcaster, um, even uh, Base uh, and different ecosystems where we are heavily integrated to the point where uh, any creator, any user on that on that uh, ecosystem can uh, launch a reward uh, natively, and I think that also helps us acquire these users uh, in a very like meaningful way and keep them engaged. So uh, those are like sort of some some things that like set us apart. Like customization is something that by far most people ask for, um, and obviously pricing and other things uh, also differ in the way we operate. Right. Yeah. And, and there's definitely an, an, an continuous upward trend when it comes to airdrop and, and bounties. It's uh, by now yeah. a pretty proven model, whether, you know, whether you're just using it to generate some initial trust or initial traction or even for your existing community. So um, yeah. it's, it's widely, widely applicable. Um, and so you, you mentioned um you made it gasless how did you achieve that is that does that mean any token any chain or only specific chains how, how, how does that work so you can sponsor a campaign where you can choose to sponsor gas um, and it makes the entire experience of claiming the token or nft entirely gasless no fees whatsoever yeah and and for for the rewards is that uh, are you using an oracle like how, how is that connected in the back end basically when a user let's say completes a certain action yeah like we verify these actions whether you've completed it or not and generate a signature which is then matched in the smart contract that we've written and if it, if it matches then you're eligible to claim and we can do that with any action so it matches from a manual kind of project input or is there also an, an automated um, system behind that? So there's an automated system for about 20 to 30 requirements that we've built in-house that applies to a lot of people. Like it could be like simple things like submit an email or collecting an email list or join on Discord or join on Telegram or follow on Twitter. Everybody likes to use these requirements. So we've automated those and for custom ones, we, we can add it like very easily. Okay, understood. And what are your plans in terms of, you know, kind of future future developments? Where, where what is your vision? Where, where do you see the, the growth for your business, for the technology? What makes you excited? Yeah, I think what, what is sort of exciting is the idea that um, more largely, like crypto is being adopted. Um, uh, we've seen ETFs, we've seen several ways now, like uh, there's there's optimism around crypto adoption, but also like for CoinWise specifically, we're seeing a lot more creators and a lot more uh, platforms experimenting with this idea of points and giving away even points as tokens or giving away NFTs to continuously engage their audience. And I think it 
unlocks like a new framework for loyalty and, and that's really interesting to me on how loyalty is evolving using like what kind of tools we have so so that's always like fascinating on how like the industry itself is moving into this incentive structure where incentives are baked into daily interactions and you're basically rewarded for almost every interaction that you do by either the platform or the ecosystem and and we see this with optimism retro pgf brands where i think they airdropped millions of tokens uh, over the 100 million dollars to just people that were building in the ecosystem so this mechanism is very like evolved to the point where we're seeing like large scale adoption and i think that's fascinating to see how incentives really work um, in getting people not just acquired but also like getting regular retention and traction over time so that's really interesting to me in a, a kind of multiple um, i don't want to say attempts because it's more than just attempts if you look for example at yeah, uh, yeah. you know the brave grocer and i'm talking now to indeed a rewards and incentivization on, on, on a broader level right uh, i think that yeah, was yeah. also one of the you know kind of the goals behind that that web browser to kind of kind of share and incentivize user behavior uh I think Steam was also one of them, right? I'm not sure where yeah. they're at right now. That was the social media platform where, you know, you share content and you get rewarded. I think, well, there's multiple platforms that are doing that right now. Um, but yeah, it's it's still kind of, it's it's still kind of early stage there, right? So what do you think kind of the yeah. bottle, bottlenecks are and what, what needs to happen for, for kind of a wider adoption of this? I think like at the like the very biggest thing that needs to happen is um, there needs to be really clear utility when you claim any kind of airdrop, whether it's tokens or NFTs. I think for a lot of people that is not apparent, um, and if it's purely um, economical incentives, I feel like people end up cashing out. So there's pros and cons to it on like making sure if people continue to be invested and retain and hold whatever the token or asset is um, and giving it any kind of real utility i feel like that has always been the bottleneck there's always like you know technological bottlenecks like um there's friction points in you know gas fees and you know claiming these um, nfts or tokens but they're not eventually worth anything um, so there's friction points like those that are very clear that as an industry we're all trying to solve that's a that's a great point i think so basically you know what, what you're saying there needs to be tweaks and optimizations uh for that okay. to work it, it kind of makes me uh you know think about the the air miles and, and, and credit card points indeed there are large differences some some are very popular and you know provide good benefits so that's probably here the same with these kind of tokenomics yep. long, long term stability and benefits uh, basically okay. um exactly. so all right well what is your i mean you've been an entrepreneur for three years is it four years yep so how, how has that been? Can you share with our audience, right? Who, who either are, you know, kind of, they want to start something in Web3, you know, they're thinking about it. What, what, what would be your advice to them having had the, this four year journey right now? Yeah, I think the main advice I'd give is um, prepare for a marathon. Um, it's going to be a very long process and you're gonna have to survive through different cycles and it's very very hard i think the best way to stick to what you do is through um just talk to your users understand your users really really well and um, i think that's that sort of applies to web2 and regular startups too but also applies more here it's like you know, it's, uh, like yeah try to survive every cycle you're gonna see a lot of them um, and try to be as disciplined as you can um, and uh, by discipline, I mean in every, every way, financial and like uh, making sure like the product itself is getting real traction, uh, you're making revenue and figuring out ways to yeah just interact with your users as much as you can and understand them. I think that's something we often neglect. So I think that's this general like advice that, that probably like something that is people should routinely do. 
and 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 in terms of you know fundraising especially in these times it's, it's more challenging right we, we're recording it down 2024 early so um what would be your did you do a round for your startup or how are you fine yeah we did we did a seed round we did a seed round of 2.5 million yeah and that was in the current market or in in the last um, bull run? In the last bull run, yeah. Oh, that then yeah. is that that would be maybe the tip for for entrepreneurs that the timing is also relevant. But what would you recommend, yeah, uh, you know, entrepreneurs now when it comes to the fundraising these days? I think like when it comes to right now, uh, my friend Shreyas is a very good uh, uh, entrepreneur. He just raised around for Lama. Um, I, I think it is also worth talking to um, founders that are like more have been like doing research. So Sriram Khan and um, Ivan Lair, they recently raised around. Um, uh, I think I, one of the founders I really respect is also Socket. They've built a great infrastructure company. Um, talking to them is also really really useful. Um, yeah, these are some founders that I really respect. All right. Okay, so you're you're saying look at other founders that that were successful right now in, in fundraising in terms of yeah, I mean those are the founders that recently raised. Um, I, I think for us we've been a bit more uh, focused on growth and figuring out ways to grow the company in a more traditional way where we try to be as profitable as we can and don't have to raise again. So that's sort of been the approach for us. Uh, eventually, like obviously, that might change as we plan to like grow more. But that's that's been the goal, and I feel like that should be something that you know every founder should should eventually focus on. Uh, a lot of people like try to get to a token launch or something like that as soon as possible. But um, that's again an entirely different strategy. But but I, I think these founders itself have figured something out that um, uh, is is really great and because. Uh, and what is your, if also for your company, right? For your your situation, what is what is your kind of projection for the growth of the market, right? The, the Web3 market in general, the adoption. Or do you think it's going to be linear from here? You think it's going to be still like major kind of roller coaster type of, uh, you know, adoption, or it's going to go parabolic? What is your what is your own proje projection? Let's say. Yeah, I think like the. Uh, total number of users for MetaMask or any like market leader, if you look at them, there's about 300, 400 million, million wallets that are probably interacting right now. If you look at the market right now, those are probably the total number of users we're looking at. And at least on chain, if you look at probably numbers from Coinbase or Base and, and see the total number of users they've onboarded, they obviously work with retail investors a lot. Um, but it's probably useful to see market insights from those platforms because that give you a very clear picture of what the market is and how much adoption we're getting right now. Um, Misari is a pretty good tool to like figure that out. Uh, but looking at like projections over the next few years, I feel like crypto has already crossed a few trillion dollars in market cap. Um, I'm really optimistic going forward because there's a number of things that are changing this could that could impact the overall market one of them is ai ai is at, at sort of the verge of like interjecting and, uh, with the trajectory of crypto where we're seeing it more used in decentralized compute and, and gpus and, and different ways where we didn't see that before i think that intersection itself is going to be very interesting and it's going to impact a lot of inefficiencies in crypto itself I think it's also going to really help to see institutional adoption. So we're seeing like nations like the US and other countries, central banks adopting crypto and recognizing it as a security and slowly bringing uh, retail investors and more of the mainstream market as just any other financial market. I think that itself is going to have a huge impact. I think overall, the existing platforms that got funded and that came out of the bear cycle um, more recently they've matured and the people that actually survived are the ones that ended up either building something successful or, or probably there's a few platforms that actually end up having mainstream adoption on the consumer side a few examples of that is uniswap uniswap is doing incredibly well uh, we've obviously seen like uh, other platforms like uh, 
you can look at eigenlayer eigenlayer is also one of the really good examples on this technique so i think like we've seen more mature and disciplined and use case driven projects getting funded in the last pair cycle and i think if you factor in all of these three numbers uh, i think it could it will definitely impact the market in a very sustainable way and what what is your um so you just mentioned Uniswap, for example. Um, they're they're obviously a you know existing kind of normal company, but they're also a DAO, right? They they have this kind of setup where where yeah. you know what what is your opinion on that? Do you see that as well for for your business, or do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I feel like DAOs are really good at allocating capital in places where either they're unfunded or misallocated. So uh, for Uniswap, we've seen like examples where that kind of blew up, where governance structure passed and projects that they need to get funded got funded. I think governance itself it can be sometimes driven by like whales and it can sort of sway the votes in any direction. There's literally like DAOs and institutions that work on gaining governance power in these larger DAOs like Uniswap DAO and the, the, there's Arbitrum and there's a bunch of these other DAOs that have really huge treasuries that can allocate capital to people that make uh, like really good proposals and pass the vote but the way these votes are passed um, it's really impacted right now through, through well so I think that's a bit of a challenging part that we're still trying to figure out and see like how we can do that and it kind of like speaks on how the power is distributed within the DAO and um, who of those people can influence which direction like any of the world goes so it, it's still like a work in progress I would say like I don't think it is entirely efficient at this point but I do think DAOs can help um, like just allocate capital to the people that are like natively integrating with them and building actual products. Um, I think it's a great way to get funded um, if you're building real tools for them. I think Dune is a good, good example. Uh, people, Dune wizards get, get paid. Um, I think another great example is Arbitrum. Arbitrum DAO also allocates capital really well. Um, there's also like Nouns DAO that have allocated DAO, uh, allocated capital to other DAOs. A really fascinating one is Beta DAO that allocates capital to other neuroscience or research-based or academia-based DAOs uh, that are working on brain health and longevity. I think there are good examples of it, uh, but also it's it's very um, uh, it needs a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Right. So so basically, you, you you're saying that. You know, if if you are a business or a project that has kind of a treasury, or they they need to have some system, efficient system, to allocate capital or certain funds, and this can be a great great solution. But for maybe for a company like like your your business, Coinvice, that that might not be necessarily the case, right? I think Coinvice itself, like we've applied to a bunch of like um, grants and. Um, ways because our strategy is also like to build in ecosystems because that again answers the question we that's how we differentiate ourselves by like having really deep integrations into very specific applications and ecosystems and that's the way we capture value as well so uh, in certain cases we do like you know build and and make proposals where we can also um, get a grant to build on top of existing like DAOs and platforms Right. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I can totally imagine if you're a project, uh, potentially like Coinvice or any, any other project that that wants to have his own, let's say, developer ecosystem. You know, whether it's like app developers on top of your own applications or plugins or integrations, you you might have some treasury for that, and that can be then applied through a, a DAO potentially, in that sense. Yep. Um, final question here, uh, Janil. So uh, we we just talked about a little bit, in, indeed, about uh, you know the, the, the future of Web3, the adoption, and we also talked a little bit about funding for Web3, right? And you mentioned a couple of big companies, including in in your area, right? You're you're in Silicon Valley. Uh, a couple of layer ones, right? That got some uh, <laughs> some some good good amount of funding during the bear market. What, what what is your what are your thoughts about about that kind of um, let's say situation where there's multiple layer ones you know there's of course layer twos being built 
where do you think it's gonna head? Do you think there's gonna be, you know, just a few winners like you know the Amazons, Facebook, Google, and that will be like the layer ones, and then they have a whole, uh, I don't know how many layer twos on top, or do, or do you think there's gonna be one layer? Like, what is your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's very similar to any commoditized market. Like if you look at uh, NFT marketplaces, decentralized exchanges, it's very commoditized, right? Like if you look at DEXs, Uniswap is probably has the largest market share. NFT marketplaces, you can argue that, you know, Blur or, um, you know, OpenSea, OpenSea maybe not so much right now, but there's a few players that end up getting a majority of the market share. It's probably the same case in these one also, like whoever ends up owning a lot of the distribution will end up having a larger market share. It's extremely clear right now that base optimism, I mean, base itself more so than optimism, it's kind of ironic that they're doing majority of the uh, like onboarding for optimism. Uh, they end up like probably bigger than optimism in, in in many data points but uh, the, the good thing is anybody like that is actually a leader so you can look at coinbase or okx or anybody that's a centralized exchange that onboards retail investors they control like they're basically the first touch point for any user for any new user right so they control a majority of the distribution that can be onboarded to their ecosystems so we will see a lot of these ecosystems being uh, like, uh, uh, like there will be a two or three players that end up dominating the entire market and there will be like again smaller ecosystems which are more community driven that people are part of it because of their new niche use case which is they're either an uh, ecosystem in gaming or in ai um, or they're like, they formed a really good community around it. Maybe, you know, a really strong community launches an ecosystem like that and people start to interact on it. A good example of this is Zora protocol. So Zora launched an L2 and they have a really vibrant and strong ecosystem of creators. So they've naturally seen adoption there because they have a strong distribution and community of them. So I think those kinds of use cases will still have a chance to stand out. But again, largely it will be owned by uh, a few players just like any commoditized market. Okay, well, thank you so much, Daniel. I really appreciate your time here, and uh, I'm sure our audience also highly appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for watching and listening, and see you next time. Bye bye.